Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome to the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry webinar. Uh, this is uh, Linda Mirza. I'm a pediatric dentistry consultant at King Abdullah Medical Complex in Jeddah and one of the board members of the society. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, you all to this 11th webinar of the society. Uh, this uh, webinar is uh, organized by the SSPD uh, in cooperation with Kunuz Retage Company, Communication and Event Management Company. It's my pleasure to moderate this session tonight with Dr. Saad al -Maniyah. Dr. Saad is a joint assistant professor at the College of Dentistry in King Saud bin Abdelaziz University for Health Science. He's a pediatric dentistry consultant and the chairman of the pediatric dentistry division in King Abdelaziz Medical City, a Ministry of National Guard. And he is a board member of the Saudi Dental Professional Council at the Saudi Commission for Health Specialties. Good evening, Dr. Saad. It's uh, an honor to have you with us tonight. السلام عليكم الله وبركاته شكرا دكتورة ليندا على التقديم الجميل وفي البداية بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أتقدم بالشكر صراحة لمجلس إدارة الجمعية السعودية لطب أسنان الأطفال وبما يقومون به والحراك اللي نشوفها الفترة السابقة يعني صراحة مجهود يعني رائع وواضح للناس جميعا وإن شاء الله من كذا وأكثر وريلي واشكر الحضور اليوم لحضور very interested topics today and I think it's going to be a very rich evening today and it's my pleasure and honor to be one of the moderator in the sessions today and thank you so much دكتورة and for all أهلا وسهلا فيك دكتور الشرف لينا لوجودك معنا وبإذن الله الكل بإذن الله يستفيد مع الكوكب الرائع من الأطباء الموجودين معنا so uh, let me introduce uh, for you our first speaker tonight, Victoria Shayma Al-Tayyid. Victoria Shayma is a pediatric dentistry consultant at the pediatric dentistry department in King Fahad Armed Force Hospital in Jeddah. She will talk today about a very interesting topic, which is the prevalence of motor incisor hypomineralization, a literature review and standardization of prevalence studies. Tora Shayma will talk to us about the prevalence of MIH in the world, especially in Saudi Arabia, and she will explain for us the difference between the studies that conducted about MIH in Saudi Arabia. Uh, before I give the mic to Tora Shayma, I would like to uh, highlight that if you have any question, just please feel free to write it down in the bottom of the screen in the Q&A section we will uh, 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 answer them at the end of each presentation. And I really wish that you will have a great time. Victoria Shayma, the mic is yours. I wish you all the best. Thank you, Dr. Linda, for this kind introduction. Uh, to... Thank you, Dr. Linda, for this kind introduction. Uh, I'm proud to be a member of the Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry, and I'm honored to be given this uh, privilege and uh, to be a presenter during this night. Uh, I'm Dr. Shayma Muhammad Tayyib. I'm a consultant pediatric dentist in King Fahd Armed Forces Hospital in Jeddah, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, my lecture for tonight is about the prevalence of molar incisor hypomineralization, uh, a literature review and standardization of the prevalence studies. The outline of my lecture will be as following. I'll start by an introduction, then I'll have a brief literature review followed by prevalence of MIH worldwide, a global prevalence of, uh, from systematic reviews and prevalence of MIH in Saudi Arabia. Then we'll shed some light on certain uh, uh, topics like the need for term modification, need for standardization, uh, suggested standardization protocol, 
and the index of uh, MIH and hypomodelized uh, second primary molar and the validity and reliability of this index and how to apply the protocol and we'll wrap up by conclusion. So to start with, we have a raised concern about MIH worldwide. We don't have a scientific meeting, a dental conference. Uh, they, they keep discussing that over and over. We can explain that in the European countries that they have declined in the prevalence of dental caries and a new problem has arisen in the past 20 years. But in a country like Saudi Arabia, where dental caries is still shooting high and prevalent, why do you have to be concerned about MIH? Are we just following the lead or this problem is contributing to the high numbers of dental caries? So to answer that, we have to know we have to quantify the problem. We have to know how common it is. And to know that, we should have prevalence studies that we can rely on them. Uh, we have conducted a literature review uh, using uh, PubMed searching engine uh, for the, all the articles published in the past 20 years. Around 80 studies were reviewed. Uh, the, the included studies, they contain the term MIH and prevalence in the title or in the abstract. They were reviewed as full text or the abstract only. From our review, we had the following findings. MIH is more common in first permanent molars as compared to incisors. It's, com it's common in maxillary incisors as compared to mandibular incisors. It's more common in maxillary central incisors as compared to maxillary lateral incisors, but it's more common in the mandibular lateral incisors as compared to the mandibular central incisors. There's no difference between the right and left side. Regarding which is more common, the maxillary or the mandibular first permanent molars, we have conflicting results. Some of the studies say that the maxillary uh, first permanent molar is more common, others say otherwise. Regarding also which is more common, the less severe lesion without post eruptive breakdown or the well demarcated white opacity, also we have conflicting opinions about that. There's no sex predilection and it's more common in subjects below 10 years of age. Uh, many studies have correlated MIH with socioeconomic status and water fluoridation, but no correlation was found. Uh, regarding the prevalence of MIH, we have wide disparity between studies. It ranges from as low as 0.48 in a study conducted uh, in India, in Bangalore City, and as high as 44% in a study conducted in Australia. Regarding the pooled global prevalence, two systematic reviews show uh, results of 11 and 14%, which means that more than 800 million uh, person or subject are affected with MIH, which is a huge number. Regarding the prevalence of MIH in Saudi Arabia, we have four studies uh, about that. The first uh, conducted in Jeddah, by Dr. al Lizam and his working group. It gave a result of 8.6%. Two studies conducted by Dr. al Hamad in Riyadh region and gave results of 40%. And the last study by uh, Rizq et al, it was conducted in seven cities in Al Qasim region and gave result of 25%. So as we can see, we have wide variation between the studies. Even the studies conducted in the same country, in Saudi Arabia, we have wide variation. So why is that? This could be related to actual differences in social behavioral differences between different uh, countries, different environment, different genetic and ethnic groups. And this also could be related to the differences in study design. In a, liter uh, in a literature, a systematic review, sorry, by El Frank and his working group, in 2015, he uh, listed a number of uh, differences in the study design. So as we can see here, he reviewed the articles about the prevalence of MIH in the past 30 years. We have wide variation in the prevalences. One of the reasons for that is differences in the diagnostic criteria. 
difference in the sample uh, size. It ranges from as low as uh, we can see here, 25 subjects to thousands. The age of the subjects, it's widely variant from four years of age up to 17. Uh, some of the studies, they selected the population, others they did not do any selection. And most of the studies were conducted in cities, but some of them, they were conducted in rural area. And uh, also the calibration of the examiners is uh, some of them, they did the calibrations, others did not. And uh, the examination setting or where the examination had been done is also a variant. Some of them were conducted in hospitals, in dental schools, in uh, dental clinics, in schools. So it's widely variant. This is also his list. Applying these differences on the studies conducted in Saudi Arabia, we can find that the prevalence ranges from 8.6, as low as 8.6%, to as high as 40.7%. They all, all the studies, they use the uh, criteria of the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. The sample size was uh, also variant from as low as 267 to as high as almost 1,000. The age of in years is also variant. Some of them, they selected the population, others did not. All the studies were conducted in cities. Uh, um, the study of uh, Rizq et al, it was conducted in seven cities in Al Qasim region. Uh, as we have mentioned, all of them, they were conducted in cities. All of them, they calibrated the examiners. And regarding the examination setting, some of them, they were conducted in schools, in the dental clinic, or in, uh, or in the dental clinic, or both. So, summarizing these uh, differences, the differences are related to the sample size. Uh, it was suggested to have a minimum of 300 subjects for prevalence studies and 1,000 subjects for etiological studies. We have differences due to examination side differences the age of the subjects, the ideal age to perform MIH uh, examination is eight years of age, uh, of, uh, yes, of age. Uh, the examination protocol, uh, there is variation. Some of the studies, they did the examination while the teeth were uh, wet in accordance with the, uh, the guidelines of the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Other, they examined the teeth while they are with, uh, dry. Some of the studies, they used the daylight, others, they used artificial light. Uh, even the size of the lesion to be recorded is variant. Some of the studies, they included only lesions of two millimeters in diameter uh, in size. Others, they did not specify the size of the lesion, but the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommends only inclusion of the lesions of one millimeter in diameter to be included. Regarding the eruption status of the teeth to be included, some of the study, they excluded any partially erupted teeth. Uh, others, they included all the teeth. And some studies, they only concentrated on the 12 index teeth, which are the first uh, permanent molars and the maxillary and mandibular uh, incisors. Uh, some of the studies, they excluded the teeth affected by extensive caries. Other studies did not. Uh, some of the studies also, they included other defects. And as I have mentioned, the number of teeth uh, included in the examination is also variant. Uh, regarding the number of examiners of, uh, and their calibration also is uh, different among different studies. Some of them, they did not calibrate the examiners. Others, they did calibration using photos, standardized photos. And some of them, they do, did the calibration using subjects not included in the uh, sample of the study. Uh, other differences are related to the diagnostic criteria. Some of them, they used the developmental dental enamel index. Others, they used the modification of the Developmental Dental Enamel Index, and some of them, they used the criteria of the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, and few of them, they had their own indices. This is the index of the, um, the Modified Developmental Dental Enamel Index, and these are the criteria of the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Other differences are related to the area, is it rural or urban, in cities or otherwise? 
is it uh, a a study to be generalized on the whole uh, population? Is it a nationwide or it's on a specific area? So from the previous uh, differences in prevalence study, we have to shed some light on certain issues. Do we need to modify the term MIH, molar incisor hypomineralization, since as we know, more than the 12 index teeth could be involved, the second primary molar, the permanent canines and the premolars. So if we don't include these teeth, we might have an underestimation of the real problem and uh, the magnitude of the problem. During the uh, uh, meeting of the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry in 2014, they raised the issue for the need of standardization of prevalence studies. Following that, uh, Dr. Uh, al Ghanim and her working group, they published a study and they suggested a practical method to be employed in order to standardize the prevalence studies. Furthermore, they published another study to effectively use the index and the clinical manual, uh, manual that they have published. Uh, they developed two forms, a short form and a long form. The short form includes only the index, uh, the 12 index teeth. The long form includes all the present teeth. Uh, we should, for each tooth to be scored, we have to score the clinical status, which we get it from this index, which was developed uh, by them. They combined the modified developmental dental enamel index with the uh, index of the European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. They score the teeth from zero to seven. The areas shaded in gray, these are further uh, subdivisions to be recorded in the short form. They start from zero, no visible enamel defects. One, visible enamel defects, but it's not MIH. It could be diffuse opacities, as in uh, fluorosis, hypoplasia, amelogenesis imperfecta, and hypomineralization, but it's not one of the index teeth. Uh, it should, uh, if the, for, uh, for example, the permanent canine is affected, it falls within this uh, score, one four. The second score is uh, well demarcated opacities. Furtherly, uh, we categorize them two one and two two according it's white, creamy, or yellow brown. Then the third score is the presence of post-eruptive enamel uh, breakdown due to occlusal forces, and we have uh, loss of enamel. Atypical restoration in a patient who is, for example, caries free, and he has these white opacities in the anterior teeth, and we have a large restoration in a posterior teeth. So this is called atypical restoration, or a restoration which is extending to surfaces which are not prone to dental caries, like the middle of the uh, facial surface, for example, areas that uh, they are not uh, retentive for a plaque. Atypical caries. And uh, six, atypical extraction. As we have mentioned in a patient who is caries free, but he uh, mentions a history of having his sixes uh, badly broken down and they were extracted. Seven, in the teeth which cannot be scored due to extensive caries. Uh, in the uh, cases where uh, MIH is diagnosed, we have to furtherly uh, uh, list the lesion extent. Is it one third of the tooth, one third to less than two thirds or two thirds and more? And we have to list the eruption status. If less than one third of the tooth is erupted, we just categorize it as A, no need for scoring. If it is one of one third of the tooth is erupted, we list it as B. Uh, the previous index was uh, tested for validity and reproducibility, and researchers indicated that codes and definitions were clear and suitable for international use, and it was, uh, it, uh, was tested and it is reliable and valid. Regarding further details on how to apply uh, the guidelines, uh, they specified the steps and the uh, techniques to be used. So they recommended uh, to have a trained, a minimum of a trained examiner and preferably an assistant with him if it's not available uh, to use voice recorders. 
to, uh, of course, you, uh, follow the standard infection control protocol, preferably to use disposable mirrors and uh, explorers. Regarding the position, the ideal situation is to examine the subject while he's on the dental chair for better uh, visualization. If this is not available, the subject should lie flat comfortably, uh, comfortably or sitting on a dental chair of, uh, or if he's uh, young to do a knee to knee examination. The teeth should be properly cleaned to use non-magnifying light source and ball ended explorer. We should be systematic in the recording. We start from the upper right side, going to the midline, then the upper left side, going to the lower left side, midline, lower right side, to avoid missing any of the teeth. We should, as we have mentioned, record the following, the clinical status from this index, and if the teeth are diagnosed, <coughs> sorry, with MIH, which means they follow uh, in the category from two to six, we have furtherly to uh, record the defect extent and the tooth eruption status. And also, we have to mention if they are mildly or severely uh, affected, mild, which means without uh, post-eruptive breakdown, severe with post-eruptive breakdown. Uh, regarding the calibration of examiners, which is uh, very important, uh, they uh, suggested a set of standardized photos to be viewed in standardized condition, meaning in the same uh, situation, the same lighting, uh, the same brightness of the computer, and uh, read the photos three times at least, one, uh, one week interval between them, and repeat the examination for the uh, same examiner to have uh, intra-examiner reliability and for different examiners to have inter-examiner uh, calibration. And uh, the results, uh, the scores uh, should be entered in a digital system and should be above uh, 0 0.81. This is an exercise for scoring. Uh, picture number one, if we want to score it, we have an enamel defect, it's diffuse, it's affecting all the teeth. So we have an enamel defect, but it's not MIH. It's not well demarcated opacity. So it is one for the short form. For the long form, we furtherly categorize it as one one. And we don't need to uh, uh, score the lesion extent or the uh, eruption status since it's not M uh, MIH. Regarding uh, photo number uh, B, we have an area deficient in enamel. We don't have enamel, so we have an enamel defect again. This is categorized as one for the short form. For the long form, this is considered as hypoplasia. And again, we don't need uh, to categorize according to the uh, extent of the lesion or the eruption status. As we have mentioned, it's one for the short form, one one for the long form and for B, one and one, two. Regarding this picture, we have atypical restoration, which is four for both the short form and the long form. And since it falls within the categories from two to six, we furtherly uh, score it for the lesion extension, which is about half of the tooth is involved. So it is two and the tooth is erupted. So it's B. So for both short and long forms, it's four and uh, category two. This is the last picture to be uh, scored. This is a bit tricky because we are depending on the picture to diagnose the tooth. We don't know, is it a discoloration or this, the enamel is deficient? And we cannot see the sixes to say this is MIH or not. So we can categorize it as enamel defect, but not MIH, it could be hypoplasia. And also we can categorize it as well demarcated uh, opacity. Furtherly, we have, as we can see, this is yellow and here it's creamy white. Usually when we have uh, two lesions, we uh, categorize it according to the more severe. So we categorize it as two, two. And since it falls between the two and six, the lesion extent is about more than a third of the tooth, so it's two. 
and the tooth is more than one third erupted. This is for the short form and for the long form. So in conclusion, we have a great need to standardize the prevalence of the studies to know the magnitude of the problem. Do we have to be concerned or not? And to conduct nationwide studies that represent the population uh, on which we are uh, working to know how to uh, plan and design preventive and uh, treatment programs and to conduct longitudinal studies to know is the problem increasing or decreasing. For example, we conduct the study for the same subjects at the age of six, then two years later at the age of eight, 10, and so forth. And we should include more than the 12 index teeth. And we include studies that uh, combine not only the prevalence, also the etiology of the problem to properly address it and to design programs to solve this problem. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaima, uh, for this informative lecture. Um, uh, the references, uh, if anybody is uh, interested to see the references, Dr. Shaima listed the references uh, between her slides during the presentation. And uh, uh, okay, before we go to the questions of the audience, I have one question for you, Dr. Shema. Uh, from your point of view, what are the future studies uh, that we conduct, can we conduct regarding MIH in Saudi Arabia? Well, we need to conduct a prevalence study which represents the society. We need okay. collaboration between different ministries, the Ministry of Health, uh, the Ministry of Defense, and to conduct a study in collaboration, we can do it as we are doing uh, prevalence studies for the care, for dental caries for MIH as well. And we should also uh, do prevalence studies to correlate between the etiology and the problem. We should know the magnitude of the problem, at what are the reasons behind it, and how is it affecting uh, the prevalence of dental caries. So uh, what do you think the limitation that we can face during conducting such studies? Well, we need collaboration between different uh, sectors, as I have mentioned. Uh, it needs uh, a team within uh, our Saudi uh, Society of Pediatric Dentistry. We can uh, initiate uh, a work group to start this uh, initiative, and we start a prevalent study that could be generalized. We start with the main cities, and then we can include the, the whole regions, and we can have numbers that we can generalize it on the whole population. Uh, so uh, can you please tell, um, uh, tell us one of, the condition, one of the cases that you treated for MIH? What are the treatment uh, modalities you use from your ex clinical experience? Uh, okay, uh, well, uh, this is uh, going to be discussed uh, in the lecture of Dr. Isra, but from what we have seen uh, on daily basis, we see MIH cases with wide range from uh, patients who are already suffering from dental caries, and this is exaggerating the problem. When they have dental caries, but the sixes, uh, the patient comes at uh, the age of eight, with the sixes, uh, they are uh, hopeless, and they need to be extracted. Uh, some of the cases, no, we go for stainless steel right away. We cover them with stainless steel. Uh, sometimes the patient, they are caries free and they have very good oral hygiene, but they complain from headache or sensitivity. So this could be uh, related to this problem. Uh, they are having MIH and they are unaware because the teeth, once they erupt, they start uh, breaking down, especially in severe cases. I really like the clinical pictures uh, you address regarding the scoring of MIH. Uh, I just want to ask you, how can we generalize the criteria for diagnosis MIH regarding different uh, cities uh, in Saudi Arabia? We have to use the same uh, index, whether is it the, uh, the index uh, by Dr. Ghanem and her working group, or the previous indices. There's nothing wrong to use the previous indices, but we should use the same criteria. Uh, 
and apply them for all the studies in order to compare them, to be comparable and to have comparable results. We don't want to have this wide range of conflicting results. So I have one question here from one of the audience. Uh, do we have any early predictors that may help in getting the diagnosis of MIH and its treatment? We don't have a definitive predictor. Uh, the problem with MIH that we don't have a cause and effect relationship. We have risk factors. We, we have in certain indicators. Uh, we are uh, supposed to take a medical history from each of our patients. So if the mother mentioned that she had problem during pregnancy or during uh, delivery or in the first four years of age of her child, this is an alarming sign. This is one thing. Another thing, if we examine the ease or the second uh, primary molar, and we find the hypomodalized defect, this is an alarming sign, and we have to notify the parents and the, keep the patient under follow-up. So whenever the sixes erupt, we uh, prompt with the management. I have one question here regarding the education. Uh, the audience say, can you please highlight more about the etiology of MIH so we can prevent this by counseling the pregnant ladies. How can we educate the pregnant ladies about that? The pregnant ladies should be aware that anything that they eat, their behavior during pregnancy, it's not uh, affecting them alone, it's affecting their kids. Uh, and as we keep educating them that they should uh, manage their dental condition before even conceiving, the same thing applies to uh, MIH, that any problems, some of the problems, they are unavoidable. Like uh, uh, the mother, she had complications during delivery. It's unavoidable, but at least we should inform them, visit the dentist as soon as possible so we can as early uh, manage the case and diagnose it. This is the most important uh, thing to be stressed on. Uh, I have one question from Dr. Hanadi Hanjawi. Do you think that researchers should include a younger age group, seven to nine years, rather than nine and above? Uh, yes, uh, it's recommended uh, to start uh, for the screening of MIH to start it at the age of five to uh, diagnose the second primary molar if it's hypomineralized. But uh, it's my own opinion, it's not scientific. We should start it earlier because if the tooth, the second primary molar in a country like our country where the prevalence of MIH is, uh, the prevalence, sorry, of dental caries is very high, by the age of five, the E will be destructed and extracted. So we should start early to screen them, but the recommendation is to screen the uh, second primary molar at the age of five and the first permanent molar at the age of uh, eight before the destruction and the conceit. <clears throat> consequences, sorry. Uh, do we have any index to categorize the severity rather than the clinical status of MIH? We have lots of uh, categorization and uh, lots of systems. As I have mentioned, uh, the MIH is a hot topic and uh, uh, it had been discussed widely within the f uh, past 20 years. Uh, the simplest categorization is mild and severe mild without post-eruptive breakdown and severe with post-eruptive breakdown. So usually the mild cases, we treat them uh, more with prevention. With post-eruptive uh, breakdown, we go to restorative uh, treatment, uh, unless it's an, an anterior and we have aesthetic concern and sensitivity. So usually this is what uh, dictates our uh, plan of treatment. So I have one question from Dr. Abdelaziz. Do you recommend to use the salvardenine fluoride for the treatment of hypoplasia? Uh, well, uh, salvardenine fluoride is used more with dental caries. Uh, I'm not aware uh, it's, uh, it could be uh, for the management of hypoplastic uh, lesions or uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. No, I'm not aware of uh, this kind of use. Uh, so I have another question. 
uh, do you think that MIH patients, uh, how can we touch, uh, they, they also they, uh, suffered from sensitive teeth, so how can we touch them uh, if they are not getting anesthesia? Well, this is going to be discussed in the lecture of Dr. Isra. Uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, techniques to be used. Uh, we start uh, by uh, using a rubber dam. Uh, regarding the local anesthesia, we have certain types of local anesthesia that works with these patients, and uh, we keep saying prevention. Uh, usually what we do is caries control without uh, using handpiece. Uh, do caries control, temporize all the teeth with glass enamel. This is, will minimize the sensitivity, and I'll leave the rest of the management to Dr. Isra. Yes, I agree. So, and I, I think from my point of view that we have to focus on prevention. We have to educate the communities regarding the prevalence and the etiology of MIH. So, from your uh, point, from your personal uh, opinion, uh, what uh, strategies we can conduct in our society regarding the uh, 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 community education regarding MIH? Starting from schools or yeah, as I have the mothers, they should know that anything that happens to them, this is an alarming sign that the teeth might be affected. You don't want to scare them, but they should know about that. Uh, and this is a part of the preventive uh, protocol for the mothers. And we should educate them to come to visit the dental clinic as soon as possible. Uh, this is of great importance to apply the preventive uh, protocols on them. Uh, from your personal view as well, uh, do you think that the general dentists, if they, uh, if they, took, uh, if they take enough experience, can they categorize, can they diagnose the MIH, or they have to be specialists or consultants in pediatric dentistry? Uh, no, you don't have to. Uh, the general dentists, they have enough knowledge to know what is hypomineralization, what is hypoplasia. Uh, they can, they, uh, if they uh, attend the uh, didactic courses and lectures, they, they can know about that. And from my personal opinion, they should know because uh, we have high number of MIH cases and they, are, they might be the first line to uh, discover them. Maybe in uh, the management, they won't be, uh, uh, they, they won't have the enough confidence to manage them but regarding the diagnosis and to discover them, they might be the first to discover them and to apply the preventive uh, strategies. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shayma, for this presentation. I will give the mic now to Dr. Saad al uh, to uh, introduce the second speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Landa. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Shaima, about your interesting topic about the prevalence uh, of MIH. And uh, I liked what you said about the collaboration and research between uh, different uh, sectors in the kingdom uh, to have a very, uh, really solid uh, um, uh, data about MIH in Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, now we'll go to the other talk uh, delivered by Dr. Uh, Isra Sharif. Uh, the topic will be uh, touch the emphasize uh, the importance of early management uh, of uh, MIH uh, with pediatric patients. Uh, and uh, also it will uh, make, uh, also will emphasize on the possible treatment uh, options of MIH. Uh, uh, now the mic for you, Dr. Isra, and wish you all the luck. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All right, doctor, you can share the screen. Thank you. Heard? Yes, thank you. And slideshow, please. Okay. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, uh, thank you. Uh, th uh, um, 
um, I have the honor to, uh, to, share, uh, to participate in this scientific day. Um, I'm Dr. Asra Sharif, consultant of pediatric dentistry, working in King Fahad Army Forces Hospital. Today, I'm gonna represent the role of pediatric dentists in the management of molar incisor hypomineralization, MIH. The molar incisor hypomineralization is development and qualitative defect of enamel mineralization due to systemic factors affected one to four of permanent first molar and frequently associated with permanent incisors. It can also be observed in second primary molar tips of permanent canines and second permanent molars and the premolar. Incisor and enamel defects are frequently quite extensive and most common in the labial surface Uh, of the teeth, giving rise to cosmetic concerns. As Dr. Shayma said, uh, the best age to examine these patients at the age of eight, where most of the index teeth erupted, and the examination should be on the cleat with surface of the index teeth, and the size of the defect should be at least one millimeter to be recorded. Uh, there are several ways to classify the um, molar incisor hypomineralization. One of them is the modified developmental defect of enamel. Uh, giving it uh, two uh, digits uh, that uh, describe the extent and the type of the lesion, whether it's demarcated, white or cream, yellow or brown, diffuse opacities in form of lines, patchy, confluent, confluent patchy and staining with loss of enamel, or hypoplasia in the form of pits, missing enamel or any other defect, giving, the, uh, giving it a, a code uh, uh, from one to nine in ascending order, and the extent of the lesion, the code will be zero if it's less than one third, more than two thirds, uh, uh, more than one third, but less than two thirds, the code will be two, and more than two thirds, the code will be three. And the letters that describe the combination of lesion, if it's demarcated or diffuse, demarcated and hypoplasia, diffuse and hypoplasia, or the D if, uh, is combination of all the previous effects. It also classified my math muju and right to mild, moderate, severe. The mild if demarcated opacities are in non-stress bearing area of first permanent molar. No enamel loss in the, is present in opaque area. No dental sensitivity. No care is associated with affected enamel with or without mild incisor involvement. The moderate type, it show intact atypical restorations. Demarcated opacity are present in occlusal or incisor one third of the teeth. Post eruptive enamel breakdown with or without caries that is limited to one or two surfaces without cuspal involvement, no dental sensitivity, aesthetic concern are frequently expressed by the patient or parent. The severe type, it shows the post-eruptive enamel breakdown. There is history of dental sensitivity. Widespread of caries is associated with affected enamel. Crown destruction can readily advance to involve the dental pulp. Defective atypical restoration is present and aesthetic concerns are expressed by the patient or parent. Other classification by Malini, degree one, mild, is isolated white and cream to yellowish brownish discoloration on the chewing surface or upper part of the crown. Degree two, moderate, yellowish brown enamel affecting more or less all the top of the crown with a slight loss of substance. Degree three, severe, large scale mineral deficiency with distinct yellowish brown discoloration and defect in crown morphology resulting from extensive loss of enamel. Here is the diagnostic criteria that are given by European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry in the form of demarcated opacity, any aberration from the normal translucency of the teeth, whether it's white, creamy, yellowish, or brown discoloration. Usually this enamel have normal thickness, but uh, the mineralize mineralization is deficient or enamel disintegration in the form of the post-eruptive enamel breakdown. This enamel show the porosity with, um, uh, with less hardness, low, uh, modulus of elasticity, and this is aggravated more by the occlusal forces or by trauma. Atypical restoration that usually don't conform to the size and shape of regular restoration, tooth sensitivity, whether it's mild or spontaneous, extracted teeth, if the extracted teeth due to MIH can be defined only if other index teeth revealed uh, demarcated opacities, otherwise it's not possible to diagnose it. And erupted teeth, if the index teeth have not yet erupted and it's exceeding the chronological time markedly. So the management of the uh, pediatric patient who uh, exhibit signs of molar incisor hypomineralization, starting by risk identif identification, by taking detailed past uh, history for the pregnancy and the delivery of the mother, and um, after the delivery by four years, 
uh, and also identify if the presence of any sign of hypomineralization in the second primary molar, early diagnosis, once it shows any sign of the uh, opacities of post-eruptive enamel breaking down, uh, desensitization and remineralization, prevention of caries and post-eruptive enamel breakdown, restorations or extractions and maintenance. One of the options is to uh, enhance the prevention and enhance the remineralization and minimize the sensitivity. Uh, we can use the casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate. This increases the saturation of saliva with calcium and phosphorus and which bind firmly to the biofilm and it increases in saturation uh, that penetrate to the subsurface and to the body of the legion. It usually used at the early stage of eruption and not completely matured surfaces, and it comes uh, in different commercial form, tooth mask that contains 10% casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate, MI paste that contains 10% casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate, and 0.2% sodium fluoride, enamelone treatment gel that contains 970 parts per million of fluoride, and casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate, um, that has similar mineralization effect compared to the codec that containing 5,000 parts per million of fluoride. It comes in form of tooth cream, lozenges, and chewing gum. But it's contraindicated in patients who are allergic to milk because it contains casein. And Pacini et al. found significant improvement in tooth sensitivity after the use of tooth moss and recommended a mild uh, sensitivity. Here is the tooth moss and MI paste that contain also 0.2% sodium fluoride, and the Novamine that contain very fine bioglass particulates around 80 micrometer, and it has better effect than the tooth moss. How it works? It, contain, it contains the calcium, sodium, and phosphosilicate, which are the natural elements that found in the healthy uh, tooth and bone. Uh, it acts by increasing the pH, that uh, promote the hydroxyapatite formation by react the saliva with the, uh, with the sodium and the pH uh, reach up to 8 to 8.5 percent and increase the mineral release by increasing the calcium and phosphorus and saturating the saliva with ions that is important for remineralization and uh, help to build the hydroxyapatite crystals. The demineralized region attract the calcium and phosphorus ions with, where they build the new hydroxyapatite crystals. And also it kills the bacteria because the sodium and calcium uh, cause the cytolysis or the programmed cell death of the bacteria by changing the osmolarity. The fluoride varnish, which is considered the richest source of the professionally applied fluoride, the 5% sodium fluoride contains 22,500 parts per million of fluoride. The fissure sealant can be applied in the mildly affected teeth when it's fully erupted and um, adequate moisture control can be achieved uh, when the teeth show intact enamel with good hardness and it's caries free. But the hypomineralized enamel uh, compared to the sound enamel had many problems. It contained three to 15 folds higher protein com contents compared to the normal enamel. Most of them is albumin, not amylogenin. And the affected enamel has at least 20% less mineral content compared to sound enamel. It's less in calcium and phosphorus and high in carbon, which prevents the uh, proteolytic enzyme like the metal, uh, metalloproxy, uh, matrix metalloproteinase enzyme. And it shows the unfavorable etching pattern, path, uh, pattern three. And to improve the retention, the pretreatment with deproteinizing agents such as sodium hypochloride or papain based papakari gel or total H2 adhesive system technique before the application of the fissure sealant to improve the retention. And it's important to monitor the fissure sealant to be maintained for a long time and avoid deterioration of the underlying tooth structure. In case if the uh, moisture control cannot be properly achieved or the tooth is partially erupted with minimal post-eruptive enamel breakdown, the glass ionomer cement can be used. And should it cover entire occlusal surface, up to the caspal level. Uh, if the uh, restorative treatment is the option or the extraction treatment is the option, there are several challenges, challenges that face the pediatric dentist to um, manage su such a child. There is difficulty in achieving profound local an anesthesia, behavior problems, bonding difficulties, determining cavity borders, selection of appropriate treatment, age of the patient, and aesthetic concern. 
The hypomineralized enamel is considered poorly insulated due to subclinical inflammation due to ingress of bacteria in dentin, sensitivity, and hyperstimulated nerve endings, which lead to minimize the pain threshold and decrease the pain threshold. How we can over this problem? Uh, by using infiltration anesthesia with RTK 4% that shows more profound anesthesia than lidocaine 2%. Although the RTK 4% is effective as the lidocaine 2% in inferior alveolar nerve block. Buccal infiltration with RTK 4% as adjunct with inferior alveolar nerve block with lidocaine 2%. But why the RTK is more uh, producing more efficient anesthesia compared to the lidocaine? The articane is the only amide local anesthetic drugs that contain thiophyll ring instead of benzyl rings. And this leads to increase the lipid solubility in the uh, phospholipid bilayer membrane of the um, cell membrane. And also it has the high protein binding affinity. Because of the high lipid solubility, it can easily penetrate the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane and uh, attached to the inner cavity of the voltage-gated sodium channel and prevent the influx of the sodium and prevent the actual potential. And this is uh, prevent the nerve conduction and the pain. We can also increase the pain threshold by using the inhalation anesthesia or use adjunctive local anesthesia like intraosseous or intraligamental anesthesia after infiltration anesthesia or use the rubber dam to cover the unanesthetized teeth to minimize the sensitivity and uh, minimize the pain and discomfort that caused by the air of water. Use desynthetizing toothpaste before restorative appointment. And Fayyid recommended the application fluoride varnish at pre-restorative visit. And saliva ejector can be used rather than the high volume suction to minimize the discomfort. In case of the uncontrolled behavior, general anesthesia is the treatment option. Why most of the children that show sign of modern incisor hypomineralization have difficulty uh, to control their behavior? The children with the uh, modern incisor hypomineralization need frequent dental visits and they are at 10 times more than the uh, children with normal dentition in the need of the dental visit due to the post-eruptive enamel breakdown and satisfactory fillings. And a hypersensitivity that uh, leads to avoid the tooth brushing and lead to the caries and this is worse in the problem. And the affected molars are at 10 times of risk of developing caries if they are severely hypomineralized. And the choice of the best restorative intervention or material is governed by several factors, like the ex extent of defective enamel, quality of both defective enamel and unaffected parts of the tooth, the presence of sensitivity, and the age of the patient. Restorative treatment option of hypomineralized permanent first molar. Resin infiltration, glass enamel restorations, composite restoration, full or partial coverage extracoronal restoration. The resin infiltration is known as erosion infiltration. It removes the rel relatively intact surface layer and opens the channels to infiltrate to the body of the lesion by using low, very low viscosity resin, which is capable for penetrating the demineralized enamel. It can be used also in incipient caries or caries water spot lesion. Uh, reaching up to outer third of dentin. The only system that's available in the market is the Icon system, which consists of Icon Edge, 15% hydrochloric acid for two minutes, the water rinse for 30 seconds, then Icon Dry, 99% of eth ethanol for 30 seconds, then um, Icon Infiltrant, which is metacrylate based resin and light cured for 40 seconds. It has several advantages when it's used in the posterior teeth. It improves the micromechanical uh, uh, properties by increasing the hardness up to 15% and decrease the post eruptive enamel breakdown, improve the retention of composite resin restoration. It can act as a fissure sealant and not interfere with occlusion or being broken by occlusive forces if it's placed on caspal incline. And it infiltrates more in severe MIH. But it has the following disadvantages limited strength, not more than. Um, 15% increase in the hardness, require good isolation, not bioactive, and not suitable to the mild or deep lesion. Because the molar inside the hypomineralization usually started at the dentino enamel junction and the inner third of the enamel, below the uh, intact uh, upper two thirds of enamel. The amalgam is not recommended, it's not, adhes it's not adhesive, uh, and it have poor retention in the shallow cavity, and it requires certain geometrical cavity outline 
prone to marginal leakage, offer no mechanical support of adjacent tooth structure. It acts also as poor insulator. The glass ionomer restoration, it can be used as interim restoration that have soothing effect on the hypersensitive pulp that allow for subsequent shorter and more comfortable dental visit, easy to handle, bond chemically to tooth structure, uh, has an advantage of fluoride release, support the remaining tooth structure, prevent further enamel breakdown and caries development. Here is some cases that restored with the glass ionomer restoration. There is a modified glass anomer can be used too. It has better wear resistance, better handling properties, and better fracture resistance. There is in composite can be used as definitive restoration when the defective enamel is confined to one or two surfaces without cuspal involvement. Uh, and it has usually we place the super gingival margin and exhibit good wear resistance. It can be used solely or in sandwich technique after temporization with the glass enamel cement, but it's technique sensitive, good moisture control and the rubber dam and need long placement time. The structure of hypomineralized enamel after acid etching with phosphoric acid under the scanning electron microscopy, it show minimal interprismatic dissolution, little intercrystal porosity, limited microtag formation and weakness and, and crack propagation within the enamel. We can see on the left side the uh, normal and sound enamel that show uh, the rod and interrod enamel. On the left side, we can see the hypomineralized enamel that have a uh, disfigured enamel structure in the form of rod and interrod enamel. And after etching, usually there are three etching patterns in the enamel. Type one, that result in dissolution of the prism core. Type two, in dissolution of the prism periphery. Type three, deep etching is not achieved and only the crystals around the prism is partially removed. Type 1 and 2 that provide adequate adhesion while type 3 is undesirable pattern and the acid etching enamel affected by MIH may produce surface matching type 3 pattern. Here we can see the type 1 that result in dissolution of the prism core, type 2 that result in dissolution of the prism periphery, and type 3 it's only partial removal of some crystals around the uh, prism periphery. Uh, the cavity design is important. The cavity design is important uh, either to use conservative approach that remove only the soft and damaged enamel and place the uh, uh, margin of the restoration on the hypomineralized enamel after it reach certain resistance uh, with a prop and burr. And on the left side, it's the less conservative approach by removing all the MIH affected enamel, leave the preparation border in healthy tooth substance. And the uh, adhesion to hypomineralized enamel to improve the bond strength, we have to uh, change the cavity design. Enamel pre-treatment with 5% sodium hypochlorite to remove the protein and uh, resin infiltration to increase the retention to the composite restoration. Total H2 adhesive that shows superior results compared to self-etching primer adhesive. Here is uh, a photo that shows the pre and post-operative um, appearance of molar treated with composite. Other photo. The uh, restorative choice is the full or partial coverage extra coronal restoration. The cell steel crown is the most commonly used one. It prevents further uh, post eruptive enamel breakdown, manage the sensitivity, establish occlusal or interproximal contact. It requires little or no preparation and can be done in single visit. Here are some teeth that restored with the cell steel crown. Other choice is the performed malleable composite temporary crown that come in different sizes, like the pro temp uh, crown uh, temporization material that can offer good aesthetic options and uh, needs some tooth preparation. The, qu the crown will require some adjustment, easy and can be um, finished in single visit. Other type of the partial coverage of extra coronal restoration is adhesively returned onlay or cuspal onlay that provide the cuspal coverage and uh, give the operator the flexibility in the replacement of restoration margin. 
it avoid unnecessary proximal restoration, enable accurate supragingival margin, can be made out with material with good wear resistance. But it has the following disadvantages. It, its technique sensitive, require accurate impression, and require several visits, and relatively inexpensive, relatively expensive. Here is a photo of the gold retained, uh, adhesive uh, retained, cast gold overlay. In the case of the badly destructed, severely hypomineralized molar, the extraction will be the treatment of choice. But the selection of the best time of extraction, this is the crucial uh, point. And the best uh, age for extraction is from age 8 to 10, when the bifurcation of the permanent second molars formed. Other con orthodontic consultation should be done before the extraction of other permanent first molar for compensation from the opposite arch and balance within the same arch. Orthodontic cons consideration like the crowding and favorable skeletal base relationship and the presence of other dental anomalies like congenital missing second premolar. Here we can see a case of a child that showed the badly decayed lower permanent first molars and the upper left uh, decayed first uh, left molar. And we can see the evidence of the formation of bifurcation on the second permanent molars. Management of enamel opacities on the anterior teeth. There are possible treatment uh, options. Uh, is the microabrasion, macroabrasion, tooth bleaching, edge bleach seal technique, resin infiltration, composite restorations, or veneers. The microabrasion is indicated when the discoloration is limited to outer surface of enamel, especially in the brow mottling. Not more than 100 micrometer should be removed throughout chemical erosion and mechanical abrasion using 11% hydrochloric acid with pumice. Apply to the enamel with rubber cup or a stiff bristle brush for 20 to 30 seconds. It's safe, efficient, and atraumatic method for removal of superficial enamel defect. Some research suggests this technique to remove the hypomineralized superficial enamel layer, followed by application of casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate to improve the remineralization and minimize the sensitivity. Macroabrasion is other alternative technique for removal of the localized superficial white spot and other surface stain or defect by applying light intermittent pressure using 12 fluted composite finishing burr or fine grit finishing diamond burr using high speed hand piece. The air water spray is recommended as coolant and to maintain the tooth in hydrated state to facilitate assessment of the uh, defect removal. Here we can see the macro abrasion using the finishing diamond burr. Also, this case that use the macro abrasion to remove the cervical uh, white discoloration. Tooth bleaching is usually indicated for adolescents and the aim is to camouflage the white opacity by increasing the overall brightness of the teeth. But the possible side effect is the sensitivity mucosal irritation. The home bleaching is recommending throw, uh, recommended through the carbamide peroxide into the custom fitted tray. This is the gentlest treatment uh, option for bleaching. Uh, and for further protect, protection, combined use of calcium phosphopeptide, amorphous calcium phosphate, tooth moss, and the bleaching gel is recommended. Uh, and the calcium phosphopeptide, amorphous calcium phosphate will not interfere with the action of the bleaching gel. Uh, the aim of the use is to increase the remineralization and improve the aesthetic consideration. Uh, some uh, authors suggested that the use of casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate for two hours daily for three months in order to um, gain the proper remineralization followed the combined use of casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate bleaching gel for two months to improve the aesthetic outcome. And usually the percentage of the use of the bleaching agent, whether it's uh, carbamide peroxide or hydrogen peroxide to the casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate uh, from one to six or three to four, depend on the uh, degree of the uh, demineralization and opacities. Here we can see a case before and after the bleaching. Edge bleach seal technique. This uh, technique suggested by Wright et al. 2002 to remove the yellow brown stain. The affected tooth should be etched first with 37% um, phosphoric acid or 12% hydrochloric acid, then 
continued application for 5% sodium hypochlorite bleaching gel for 5 to 10 minutes, then the tooth re-etch and cover with a protective layer such as clear fissure sealant or composite bonding agent. With this technique, the yellow-brown stain can be eliminated, leaving the white mottled appearance, which is more aesthetically acceptable. Here is the technique uh, started from the left side with the acid etch uh, for one minute, then wash it, then uh, application of the bleaching agent for five to 10 uh, minutes, like the uh, sodium hypochlorite. Then uh, after that, re-etch and uh, place the composite bonding agent. Here is before and after. Resin infiltration. This can improve the optical properties by improving the translucency and therefore improving the aesthetics. The uh, refractory index of hypomineralized enamel filled with water is 1.33, and for the hypomineralized enamel filled with air is 1. And the sound enamel range from 1.26 to 1.65. Well, uh, when the microporosities are filled with infiltrant resin is 1.52. So the hypomineralized enamel that's filled with the resin infiltrant um, is close to the sound enamel. There are two techniques, either to use the superficial infiltration or deep resin infiltration technique. Uh, the superficial uh, resin infiltration uh, was discussed previously in the molar. And now I will talk about the deep resin infiltration technique. This technique involves the preparation affected tooth by intraoral sandblasting device to ensure the infiltration can reach to the full extent of the lesion. And this should not remove more than five micrometer from the surface enamel. And after resin infiltration, some composites can be added. And the bonding between resin infiltrant and composites of very good quality. Here's technique that used the icon uh, system in the anterior using icon edge, icon dry, then uh, the infiltrant, and the other technique by removal of some tooth substance, then apply the resin infiltration. After that, adding the composite. Here's a combined uh, case of combined bleaching and resin infiltration. Another case that use combined mi uh, microabrasion and resin infiltration in the uh, maxillary permanent first in, uh, maxillary permanent central incisors. Other case that use uh, microabrasion micro abrasion followed by resin infiltration uh, on both maxillary uh, central incisor, but on the left side it needs also composite to improve the aesthetic. Composite restorations or veneers. Composite restoration involves removal of defective enamel using diamond burr to remove about half thickness of the opacity. Composite resin build up using opaque resin to avoid excessive enamel reduction and build up the remaining using appropriate dentin and enamel shades. Here is some cases that use composite restorations uh, on the top and the composite veneers the bottom. The composite veneer could be more conservative approach if it can be, uh, can be achieved without tooth preparation. That's no removal of even defective enamel. Here is the case, the tooth was restored without even removal of defective hypomineralized enamel. But the composite has several disadvantages like the discolorations uh, where marginal fracture, long-term maintenance is required. In summary, for the mild and moderate hypomineralized molar, remineralization, fissure sealant, resin infiltration, or plastic restoration, um, starting from the uh, glass enomer, resin modified glass enomer, or composite restoration, and the severe form, we can use indirect restoration um, in the form of the extracoronal, partial, or full coverage restoration or extraction. And for the incisor, if it's mild, uh, show mild or moderate hypomineralization, uh, remineralization, resin infiltration, micro or macro abrasion, bleaching, edge bleach seal, and composite restoration for the severe indirect restoration or composite veneers. Here is the references. Thank you.
thank you, Doctora. Thank you, Shukran, Doctora Sra, for your uh, interesting topics about the uh, role of uh, pediatric dentists and um, uh, dealing with MIH. Uh, I have a uh, couple of questions for you. Uh, there is a question saying that uh, um, how about the behavior management guidance needed to deal with MIH uh, patient, especially in the severe cases? This question came from Dr. Dania Islam. Yes. Uh, first of all, we try, these patients usually have a very uh, sensitive enamel. Okay. In case of severe and controlled behavior, the general uh, anesthesia is the treatment option. But before, we should, uh, there are some tricks to minimize the sensitivity during the treatment. For example, uh, the infiltration anesthesia with articaine for persons is more for, profound than in lidocaine to persons due to its chemical composition. Uh, it's high lipid solubility and high binding af af uh, affinity that lead to the higher and more efficient anesthesia in penetrating the cell membrane of the nerves uh, and binding to the inner cavity of the voltage gated channel and prevent the action potential, which leads to the pain. We can use the rubber dam. Uh, so we cover and the anesthetized teeth and uh, minimize the discomfort that's caused by the uh, uh, saliva ejector. And the saliva ejector is recommended than the high volume suction to minimize the discomfort. Uh, some uh, authors suggest to use the fluoride varnish in the pre restorative visit. Um, and also the use of the casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium phosphate uh, is recommended to minimize this uh, sensitivity. Okay. Uh, the nitrous oxide uh, sedation, it also, uh, it also increases the pain threshold which is very low in, uh, in such patients because of the uh, porous enamel, and this is the hypersensitive enamel. Yeah, and I, I think if the uh, uh, uncooperative child, uh, the treatment option, as you said, is go more advanced, either GA or uh, yes. sedation. Uh, so uh, thank you for your answer, Dr. Isra. And there is another uh, question for you, talking about the extraction option. Mm. Uh, saying that, uh, what's your uh, thoughts on the school uh, of uh, uh, advocate for extraction as the treatment for choice is uh, crowning in the future and maybe root canal treatment? Yeah, uh, some of the badly decayed hypomineralized mono, which means that it doesn't have a good retention, uh, and it's better that to extract these teeth, okay? But the best time is the age of extraction, uh, age from 8 to 10. But we have to pay attention for the other permanent first molar because there is um, we should balance uh, for the there are two uh, important uh, things to uh, to put it in our mind is the balance from the, uh, within the same arch or the compensation from the opposite arch for the other permanent first molars, and we have to pay attention for unfavorable skeletal dental base relationship the presence of crowding, and sometimes the congenitally missing second pre-molars. So it gives us the future prediction for the amount of the spacing or, uh, or any orthodontic problem. Yeah. Uh, from my experience, if any orthodontist look at a severe, uh, 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 let's say, uh, bad decay to it, the first option for them is extraction. So uh, I don't believe that one to be the point, I mean, a uh, treatment option, because sometimes still we can uh, save the tooth, especially when we have uh, a class three patient or class two. Uh, it depends case on case. Uh, thank you for your answer. There is another question, maybe the other part of that question, and maybe it's going to be marketing for the company. The uh -huh. question is, uh, uh, I have heard that the infiltra uh, infiltration uh, iconic is not available in Saudi Arabia. Have you ever used it or find it uh, here in Saudi Arabia, please tell it. Uh, I mean, yeah, so. actually, when we, when we were in the uh, North Jeddah Dental Speciality Center, uh, I uh, I would like thank I would like to thank Dr. Imad. He brought the um, icon system. Uh, he, he can order it online from Germany, uh, but it's um, it's very effective uh, in the um, mild class two hypomineralization and also in the hypomineralized. Uh, uh, molar or and incisor and it show good aesthetic results too. All right, uh, there are two questions uh, on the same. I mean, on the same uh, uh, interests about using SDF for treating MIH. 
Uh, it can be used, but it's still under studies. The silver diamond fluoride. Yeah. yeah, the purpose of use it to, uh, for care is arrest, mainly because of a bacteria saddle effect and it minimizes the sensitivity, but it's not yet approved by the FDA. Uh, okay. So, so still there is no enough evidence behind yeah, it? Yeah, there is not enough evidence. Some studies uh, that they just, um, uh, just they give like an introduction for the future uh, study that could be done for the silver diamond chloride. Okay, uh, there is another question uh, about uh, the behavior of the child during the treatment. I think you talked about it, uh, uh, behavior uh, management, uh, for uh, such cases. Uh, yeah, and sometimes temporize it with a glass enamel that soothes the hypersensitive pulp and minimize the sensitivity. So it allows for more shorter and more comfortable uh, following dental visit. And it works with many patients. Uh, for, from my experience, doctor, sometimes the patient reach to uh, a stage, which is uh, the severe stage, that could be treated and prevented uh, earlier. I think yes. this uh, based on the uh, education of the parents about the chief, I mean, the signs and symptoms. And identify the risk factors uh, mm -hmm. and close follow up is very important uh, until the eruption of the permanent first molar and uh, before the patient, uh, before the tooth reach the occlusion and show the sign of post eruptive enamel breakdown. So the earlier treatment and intervention, the better prognosis always. Yes. All right. So, uh, from your experience, doctor, what is the most obstacle uh, dealing with the M MIH? Uh, sometimes it's to gain the confidence because usually these children are, they feel very hypersensitivity and they are uh, fearful to be touched by the dentist. Uh, gradually, until we gain the confidence uh, and improve the relationship between the dentist and the child, then um, in the beginning, we can start with the fluoride varnish or insensitizing uh, agent, then after that, temporization with a glass enamel, then finally with the stainless steel crown. And usually they are happy because they become Iron Man and, um, and they are happy. <laughs> okay, Do doctor, you talked about the home bleaching. Yes. Do you consider uh, home bleaching as uh, a conservative with the young uh, children? No, it's only an adolescent uh, after after age of 14, sometimes they just complain from the aesthetic or discrimination in a school or something like this. But usually in the kids, they don't uh, complain from it. Sometimes the parents ask about what are these white patches on the teeth. Uh, there is another question talking about, uh, do you recommend any crown required for molar hypomerization? If yes, then which is the best option? I think you talked about different uh, it's crown options. Crown, and we cannot place the porcelain infused to metal crowns in the younger children because the biological width is not fully established and short clinical crown and the growth is not yet finished. Uh, and also the pulp is very large. Okay. Uh, there is a very uh, interesting comments from uh, uh, one of the audience that uh, uh, saying, I believe improving GPs knowledge and skills in diagnosis of MIH uh, uh, is, uh, is very important and uh, uh, to minimize uh, the case to go for, C I mean, to the stage of severe. Yes. Yeah, I do agree with this one. Uh, I think, the, I think one of, one of the, 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 the role of our society to target, I mean, let's say some of the lectures to the general practitioner because they are the first line in the primary care. Uh, I think uh, MIH, one of the topics uh, should be uh, directed to the GPs in the future. Yeah, and also the dietary counseling. Um, this is the thing that's very important and uh, give the dietary advice to the parents to avoid the uh, cariogenic or erosive diet and avoid the paradox. Uh, some of the parafunctional habits is also important. And uh, I forget. Uh, I may skip the one of the slides by mistake. Uh, also, the uh, 0.4 person daily use of stainless fluoride is also um, important to minimize the uh, sensitivity and the hypersensitivity of the hypomineralized uh, teeth. Uh, doctor, uh, you talked about the MI based. Yes. Uh, I think uh, that uh, it's. Uh, it's very difficult to find it uh, in Saudi Arabia. Till now, uh, sometimes you've found it with your friends uh, bringing it from the outside the country. Yeah. 
but uh, the dealer here is not uh, making it as uh, I think we have to order more so they 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 will uh, bring more product for us uh, there is another question asking about uh, again the behavior yes I think the behavior we talked about the behavior we cover it uh, there is another challenge doctor when you talk about uh, uh, one of the treatment option is the composite veneer. Yes. Composite veneer, I think if you have, let's say, uh, the four uh, central and laterals, uh, it's very difficult to have very, uh, uh, or let's say, high-end composites with the patient's behavior. Uh, I know doing a composite veneer with someone who is uh, 20 years old is different doing it with someone who is uh, 12 years old. Uh, and uh, I think this is one of the challenges for uh, um, pediatric dentists in the clinic. Uh, yeah, uh, but some of the patients, they complain from the discrimination in the school and uh, some bullying that happened. So some children at the age of 12, they accept the idea to place sometimes the composite veneer. Okay. So uh, uh, from your experience, doctor, uh, the, the MIH, is uh, going to be more sensitive in the molar than central, right? Yes. All right. So using articane is uh, your recommendation to, uh, to deal with this uh, uh, sensitivity, right? Yeah. Or, let's, say, uh, let's say change the pain threshold of the case. Yeah, it's uh, the articane is more effective in filtration, but it shows a similar effect to lidocaine in inferior artery nerve, nerve block. So we can use as uh, adjunctive local anesthesia that can be given, uh, but it minimizes the sensitivity um, markedly. Okay. Um, what about, there is, a, there is another question, what about tooth uh, moves? I think yeah. we can improve the cases by uh, prescribing, prescribing it, right? Yeah, it's uh, quasi impossible. Similar to the MI base, uh, I think so. Similar to the MI base, right? Yeah, but the MI paste also contains 0.2% sodium chloride. The tooth mass, it just contains the uh, calcium phosphate with calcium amorphous calcium phosphate. Do we have a toothpaste that prevents uh, or treat MIH? It's not treat, but to minimize the sensitivity, there are many products available in the market, like the Tensudan that contains tennis fluoride and it contains novamine as well. Uh, is whole technique advisable for MIH? In the permanent first molar, no, but if in the second primary uh, molar, yeah, sometimes we can do it. All right. Uh, actually, doctor, I'm, I'm receiving a lot of, uh, I mean, thanks uh, for your lecture, interesting lecture, so I have to convey this one. Uh, some of the audience uh, requesting your email, I think, uh, Dr. Linda, by the end of the lecture, I would... Uh, the event, uh, she will uh, share uh, both uh, speakers' emails on the screen. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Are the primary canines also associated with MIH? Uh, mostly is the permanent, not the primary, because the uh, primary it usually go, <clears throat> uh, go to normal attrition, and even if it's the uh, primary uh, canine cusp is affected. Usually, it go uh, undergo through a normal attrition procedure, so we cannot see it, but mostly in the permanent uh, canine tip. Uh, uh, there are more, no more questions. Uh, by the end, on behalf of the the event today, hosted by the Saudi uh, Pediatric Industry Society, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Isra, and also Dr. Shaima, and. Uh, the mic uh, now for Dr. Linda. Dr. Linda. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Saad, for this uh, informative discussion with Dr. Isra. I really enjoyed that in this uh, webinar, uh, we talked about the prevalence of MIH in Saudi Arabia and how the severity is that problem in our country. And then in the next presentation, we, uh, Dr. Isra, uh, explain how can we manage this problem. So thank you so much for both of them. So uh, 
uh, at the end of the, this webinar, I really would thank Dr. Shema Al-Tayyib and Dr. Isra Al-Sharif for their scientific contribution. Dr. Shema explained about the studies of MIH in Saudi Arabia, and Dr. Isra uh, discussed about the different management techniques that we can use to manage MIH in molars and anterior teeth. My great thanks is also for Dr. Saad Al Manir. We really honor to have to have to have you, Dr. Saad. Thank you so much for moderating uh, this session tonight with me. And I will take this chance to announce for the next webinar, which will be tomorrow, uh, 24 June. We will host two distinguishable speakers. Uh, we will host Dr. Anas Al Salmi. Uh, he will talk about the management of cleft lip and palate from the Pediatric Dentist Review. And uh, also we are going to host Dr. Ahmed Masoud. Uh, he will talk about the uh, maxillary canine infection. Uh, so I'm really excited to uh, attend this webinar. And I really invite all of the audience to attend this webinar tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, I really would like to announce the, uh, the uh, website uh, of our society and also uh, the Twitter webpage. If anybody is interested to know more about our future activities, they can visit our webpage. Uh, they can also visit our Twitter page. Also, they can prescribe to our YouTube channel. All the recording of all the lectures are there in the, in the YouTube channels. If you have any concern uh, or if you want to know more about the society, please feel free to write uh, to our society on the email. And uh, also, I would like to uh, invite uh, all the uh, general dentists who want to be a member of the SSPD or if any, anybody want to renew uh, their membership to visit our website and become a member of the uh, society. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank Kunuz Ritaj Company for uh, organizing this webinar free of, the, free of charge for all the audience. And also, I would like to thank the president of the SSP, Dr. Aziz Al Johar, uh, the scientific committee, and all the members of the society for their efforts in uh, uh, organizing these webinars. Uh, I really wish uh, that you will have a great evening, and I really wish that you enjoy this webinar tonight. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, my last advice that if you want to return carefully, you have to uh, follow all the precautions. I really wish that God save you and all our family. Uh, thank you so much and uh, looking forward to see you inshallah in future activities. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you.